Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very, good afternoon. really appreciate uh, all of you to be on this session, a very special session, uh, personally for me, for our organization. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, it's very kind of you that all of you have, uh, you know, uh, been very kind to join in this session uh, to, to kind of give your views, give your thoughts, and give your recommendations, give your advices, and what you've been doing on that yourselves to your organizations or personally how you think about it. So the overall topic is, you know, creation of wealth for the underprivileged. Uh, I, I would say rather by the underprivileged for the underprivileged, by comes first. So it's straight away, you know, by the underprivileged means the underprivileged people in the country, which is constituting about, uh, you know, majority, uh, you know, of the, of the population of the country, uh, where, you know, uh, there is a, there is a, there is a major need for them to uh, move ahead in their uh, how they live life, how they take it forward, and we find that you know uh, the only way for them to do it is to uh, create wealth for themselves, and the only way to create wealth is uh, through entrepreneurship. And uh, as as an organization, uh, Total Start, we have been trying very hard. It's not all the time. Uh, it's very hard. It's very difficult. It's not very really very easy. We set it up uh, informally in 2010, this engagement uh, of, uh, you know, fostering entrepreneurship in underdeveloped regions and underprivileged communities. And then we moved on uh, to setting up some, you know, uh, uh, centers at the, at, the, at the grassroots to develop uh, entrepreneurship at the, at, at the grassroots, at the rural levels and district levels. And uh, we have seen the difficulties of doing it, you know, engaging with the underprivileged, enabling them, uh, taking them to the level where we are to we, it's, it's, it's 90 percent. I think it's all entrepreneurship is 90 percent. You know, you have a failure rates, but uh, this is probably the 10 percent you have success. Also, we have uh, 90 percent failure here because enablement of the underprivileged to become, you know, entrepreneurs is a very tough uh, engagement. Uh, uh, it, it takes a lot of effort. So today's topic is creation of wealth uh, by the underprivileged, for the underprivileged, because we feel that by creation of wealth, anything can happen for them. Uh, any, any, any change can happen in their lives, in their ecosystem. Uh, they can make an impact for themselves and for the communities. And uh, we know that the government has been working in different with different programs uh, all across, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's the MSME department, uh, whether it's the, through this food program, through the enabled of micro enterprises, <laughs> through their uh, Aspire program to creating livelihood business with or, you know, uh, the, the, uh, and other departments like the agriculture and uh, cooperative and the farmers welfare, then working in different areas like formation cooperatives. Now, there's a big push of farming FPOs by the present government, 10,000 FPOs they want to create. But we know the stories of this, uh, the challenges which are there of creation of these FPOs, of these underprivileged organizations, farmers or the producers organization. There's a lot of challenges and we have been very strongly engaged with them. Uh, sirs, you'd all have your perspective on them. Uh, I, will, I will take this course later on and share some thoughts. So I will, I will start with a uh, senior most of our team, uh, CP, uh, CP to, to so, throw some light uh, on the thought, on the thought of creation of wealth by the underprivileged, for the underprivileged, what he, him, what his personal perspective to it. First, my first thing uh, from him that we, I would like him to, you know, share. And then how do you think, if you think that he has, you know, within his organization, outside his organization, through his organization, uh, ACL Tech Mindra, I know, has a has a sorry, has, has, has a large foundation and maybe, you know, or through the Tech Mindra, he has done anything. Uh, uh, see if you could throw some light on your, on the on the thought you have about this this topic about creation of by well bounded privileged for the privileged and uh, yes, please please see. Thank you, thank you. Please. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh, and it's an honor to share the panel with Vineet and. Abraham, uh, you know, I'm taking the liberty of, you know, starting with the first name, but the whole reason is that in today's society and world, 
the faster we move towards equalization and at least I can start with the names. Uh, I personally, you know, in a lot of ways came from a reasonably humble background from a small town. And it is important that we all have our own heroes. We all have people that we look up to, to draw inspiration from. And I do know that Tata Group or a Mahindra Group or, you know, uh, Dr. Ghosh, your own journey of Total Start and Vineet's, uh, you know, high impact programs. I mean, they are an inspiration by itself. But I just want to remind myself, people whom I saw coming from a more humble background and being able to create something significant. I know when I talk of my generation, it does not really mean that my children will be able to 100% relate to them. But though some of them are so big and they're still today part of our folklore. Dhirubhai Ambani from a village, uh, you know, he was a son of a poor school teacher in Chorwar. I mean, his history, his success story through his second generation is now very, very well known. But it wasn't too long ago uh, that he rose to become one of the largest employers in the world. It wasn't too long ago, 1977, when he did crowdsourcing of wealth, crowdsourcing of wealth to create many more wealthy people. I mean, today, the, the success story of the money. I mean, we all know that the money or the D Mart, as it is known, is one of the top 15 or 18 uh, top most Indian billionaires. But the reality is that even he came from a very humble background. Uh, the Warren Buffet of India, Rakesh Junjunwala. I mean, uh, when he claimed that when he is 60, he will give away 25% of his wealth. I mean, it just showed that people from underprivileged background will continue to influence the world. I can go on in this list. I mean, Dr. Devi Prasad Shetty, Again, uh, one of the, you know, nine siblings, second youngest, uh, goes on to set up uh, one of the finest known hospital chains and mainly working for the underprivileged. In my own industry, Narayan Murthy, uh, you know, Nirma, Karsan Bhai Patel, uh, Gautam Adani today, they all came from very humble background. The point I'm trying to make, whether you go into the Jamshedji Tata of 18th century, I mean, all of them will only be successful when they are successful individually, when their businesses are successful. Tech Mahindra cannot claim to have impacted about 4 lakh people during COVID if it had not been successful in business. So my favorite theme for the day, and as we discuss along, business will, should always have two objectives. One is the economic objectives and one is the social objective. And as long as we are able to balance the economic and social objectives, we will continue to celebrate Zomato, not only because they created wealth for the shareholders, but because it also employed thousands of people who would have otherwise not got a job, but today as delivery boys, they are successful and hence making an impact. Anyway, uh, Dr. Ghosh, looking forward to the conversation. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, Sibit. Thank you for a uh, quick. Uh, we'll 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 get get you know more information out of you, more knowledge out of you, more more of your thoughts to the round. Uh, uh, Abe, would you like to share your thoughts? Uh, uh, I know, but, you know, but I'm, I'm going to win it to the last because he is in the space of making an impact. 
so he will sh- he will share a lot of things and if uh, could could you share your thoughts on the thought of creation of wealth by the underprivileged for the underprivileged and uh, yes and what your organization is doing about it and what you plan to do for the future yeah thank you surya thank you for inviting me to be on this panel and i'm very happy to join cp and vidhi uh, and uh, listening to what uh, cp said i was reminded of a uh, talk i heard by doc professor vijay govindrajan a few years back so professor uh, in uh, tuck university and uh, he's famous for his three box innovation model but in the context of india he was talking about three indias one is 850 million at the bottom uh, with the per capita income of x and then there's a second india on top which is about 300 million they have a per capita income of 10x and then there's the third india which is 50 million with a again a per capita income of 100x so what he was saying is yes we are creating wealth we are having innovation entrepreneurship but most of it is being delivered to the third india which is right on top the 50 million who on 100x per capita but real wealth creation sustainable wealth creation for the country can happen only if you do something for the 850 million who are earning x per capita right at the bottom so he had this uh, uh, model which we call the business mind and social mind and business heart and social heart and what he means by mind is you know processes and all that and heart is what you feel for it so the traditional ngo he put in the space of social heart and social mind where they were really not doing business but they want to deliver something to the people they are impacting but uh, as i was talking to vinit earlier i was reminded that uh, what in his recommendation also what we really need is business mind and social heart to impact the india number 1 which is the right there at the bottom where uh, if you want to be want your initiatives to be successful then you need to have a business mind you need to be able to scale up you know and you need to uh, direct it you know where your social heart points you so uh, i was uh, you know i mean these thoughts cross my mind as the city was saying uh, was talking for the tata group it's uh, built its reputation on its uh, you know social commitment and uh, in 2007 tata group took up a program specifically targeted towards the dalits and tribals and uh, within the tata group it's known as the taap tata affirmative action program in 2010 they Uh, for three years it ran, and then they there were some learnings, and then in 2010 they decided to focus on uh, four key areas, which is education, employment, employability, and entrepreneurship. And a few years back, a third, uh, a fifth uh, focus area was added called essential enablers, and uh, these focus areas were meant to direct the efforts of the group and. when we uh, in our own company about 70% of our sales are in the trade and sector sorry yeah. there was some disturbance so let me so about 70% of our sales are expenditure is uh, directed towards the lit center okay. sorry Could you unmute yourself? Sorry, I just by mistake I uh, muted you uh, in the instant meeting message. Could you unmute yourself? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So I will. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Could you unmute? Uh, sorry. In our own company. Oh. Yeah. Is it okay now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. I can hear you. Yeah. 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 So. About 20% of our CSR expenditure gets directed towards affirmative action initiatives that is focused on Dalits and tribals. And what we also found is that you have to create wealth for the underprivileged. And uh, I don't think uh, it should be exclusively by the underprivileged for the underprivileged, but it is essential to create wealth for the underprivileged. And 
uh, and the best way to do them is to make them capable of doing that. And uh, that is where we found that Total Start is doing a, a you know, magnificent job in uh, creating those capabilities. I believe that it's not possible to really make a big difference until, until the underprivileged sections of society get access to good education, good infrastructure, good facilities. This is the, let's say the traditionally the job of the government, but then many corporates are also now getting into that space. And parallelly, because that creates the condition for the entrepreneur to emerge and the conditions for the entrepreneur to be successful. And I would think that for some time now, we will need organizations like Total Start who support them in uh, providing the capability to organize and uh, you know network, etc. So uh, I'll uh, I mean I'll keep my comments uh, to that for now. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity. Vineet, if you could, Vineet, if you could share your thoughts uh, on that particular topic and what, as an organization and individual, you have been doing. I know you're doing a lot on the topic first, and then uh, yes, no, thank I'll, you. I'll actually just share my own journey on the topic. So, so I first got introduced to extreme poverty. Uh, I come from a middle class background. I came from Jodhpur, a small city. I have uh, so not lived in big cities, uh, but when I went to live in the forest in Orissa. Uh, I actually came across poverty that shocked me also. I thought I have seen poverty, enough poverty. Uh, but the begging that you see on the crossroads of your cities is actually a professional begging. Not everybody there is poor. Uh, they are actually doing it as professional. But when you go to the forest or very remote parts, uh, their poor don't beg. Uh, they just used to at that point of time. I'm talking about 94, 95, starved to death. Uh, now, this was the kind of poverty I was not, I had not seen, I had not, I was not aware of. Uh, the second thing is, every time I met uh, people who were doing well, they were very passionate about the poor, uh, but inspired by the rich. So, they were very passionate about the poor, uh, whether it was a not-for-profit people or people who are doing reasonably well, but not really at the top. Uh, they themselves wanted to be rich. But they always were very inspired by poor. And uh, at time, I actually felt uh, to the extent of glorifying poverty. Then, when I met a lot of very poor people and I asked them, so what do you want to be? And to my great surprise, every poor person wanted to be rich. So, so I realized that on one side, India as a society basically says rich are bad. And then everybody aspires to be rich. And funnily, rich are bad and poor are good people. And this can, debate actually continues even today. That why are poor people large-hearted? They are better, etc., etc. Well, I think people are people. Rich or poor is just a circumstances. And uh, uh, amazingly, all poor people want to be rich, but no rich people want to be poor, even though poor people are better. So it's an amazing dichotomy that I walked into. And that was my first learning. That it seems like, to me, what I concluded was, Rich people want to glorify poor people so that there is less competition to become rich. Now, this is my theory. I'm not saying it's correct or not. Or the society in general did that. And society, sometimes the rules are always written by the powerful. Uh, but I think it is more problematic for others, the poor and the low income, who actually are enamored by that theory. So, so that's actually one thinking, which means my conclusion was being rich is not a bad thing. That was my conclusion. And I come from a middle class background and I came from a slightly socialist thinking. So first thing, becoming rich is not bad. That was my learning. The second thing I wanted to disaggregate and figure out how do you become rich because nobody in my family had ever done business. So people told me you have to do business to become rich. So I said, so what is business? And then I realized you have an idea, you have a person and there is capital and somebody who can connect the idea to execution and capital plays a very important role. So this was a segregation of it and it sounded to me that if poor people start doing business, they will all become rich. That was my theory. And if I can provide money to poor people to do business, then I would boil our sorted all the problems of the world and I will get the next Nobel Prize. Well, that's how I started basically in a very, I'm being slightly, uh, I'm making it sound very simple, but this is somewhere I was coming from. Now, I, as a 29 year old, launched India's first uh, Google Venture Capital Fund 
in 2001. Now that's 20 years back. Uh, even today, impact investing is a unique or a novel word for the mainstream. Uh, 2001, the term did not exist. The term got coined in 2008. So I was eight years before the term impact investing got coined. And I was trying to convince rich to give me their money so that I can actually make poor people become rich. Uh, and it was really not the best value proposition that I was offering, but I was committed to do that. And so I went around talking to people and I raised a million dollars between 2001 and five. And I tried to give this money to different people, uh, including trying to create organizations that were owned by the poor, run by the poor and managed by them. Uh, and we had some success also. Uh, Rangasutra, run by Shumita Ghosh, became a rolling success. 8,000 women became owners, etc. But I realized the challenge uh, in doing this kind of value creation. The other thing my learning was after engaging significantly with low income or poor people, that wealth is important only when you have secured a basic life living uh, right. So you should have actually reached certain level of security before you will start thinking about wealth. Now, this is a concept I'm very akin to because my father, even though being a government servant, uh, what we were very sure of is that we will not go hungry. My father will get a salary every month because he was a government servant. But we could not actually go and buy a car if we wished to. And probably we didn't have that ambition. But we were secure in the knowledge that food will come, school fees will come. And so if I am poor, what do I want to do? Do I want to become wealthy or do I want to first reach security level? Somewhere in 2006-07, it appeared to me that I was being stupid in trying to make poor rich before securing them the basic living hygiene and so since then my focus has been that i'm looking for entrepreneurs they can come from harvard wharton iit i am whosoever if they have a solution to a complex social problem where they can generate either livelihoods for the poor or the needy or they can reduce the risk and vulnerabilities in the life of the poor and needy now if you can do both these things then you are essentially reducing that risk that i'm talking about and you are giving them an opportunity to become rich. Then I also came across microfinance, where I became the largest investor, where you go to a poor and give them some money for them to participate uh, into fighting all odds to become successful and not really wealthy, but come out of poverty. And I call that impact as an indirect impact. When I create a job for somebody who is coming from poor strata, I call it direct impact. But over a period of time, I also learned that sometimes direct impact and in indirect impact both are not good enough because we are dealing in an impact imperfect world. And this imperfect world requires you a front end, which means you have to create systemic impact. And that systemic impact requires a slightly complex intervention. Uh, down the line, as we discuss and you raise various questions to us, I would try to actually reflect on what it is, but I wanted to just demystify the idea of impact. The idea of impact has to be thought from the point of the poor. And what does poor need? They want a secured livelihood. They want shock, shock mitigation towards shocks, whether it comes from insurance or from some other mechanism, like it happened in COVID. And then they want to have an opening to aspire for wealth. Wealth creation is a third level ask, not the first level ask. So we need to first reduce wealth, vulnerability to shocks. Second, we have to create uh, consistent income. And third, we have to create opportunities for those people then to participate in wealth creation. And that's how I see it. Uh, Vineet, I, I got a good perspective uh, as to how you think about it. It's 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 a very valid uh, way of thinking. I may have some uh, you know, difference of thoughts. I will give you some examples. Uh, from uh, my, my perspective, but I will do that later. What I will do is that um, yeah, I, now we got a little bit of feeler of what you all think about it. I got a perspective from uh, CP where he thinks that you know, uh, uh, creation uh, people, he has given a lot of examples of people who come from underprivileged communities, very poor background. They have, they, have, they, have, they, have, they, have, they have created wealth for themselves and they've created huge amount of you know, employment uh, and wealth also. For example, Reliance, I know he has created a lot of shareholder wealth with, uh, uh, you know, both the, both, uh, at least one son made up billions, but, uh, you know, he has also created a lot of shareholder, shareholder wealth of a lot of, you know, uh, may not be underprivileged people, but a lot of uh, low middle class, middle class people who have bought Reliance shares. And others also have done it. So CP has given some very interesting examples uh, of how people, people from the under, you know, underprivileged community has moved and made a difference, made an impact. 
uh, Abe Abram has given some very interesting example of, uh, you know, as an organization, how uh, organization has taken up, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, how to make travels, uh, you know, like we are working with uh, Abe to see that the travels become, you know, uh, uh, self sustainable as an uh, as an community and drive their own enterprise. It has been very hard, difficult path. I will share some stories with kind of not contradict maybe, but kind of complement uh, your thoughts, Vineet. And Vineet, you, what you said is uh, very interesting. And I, I see that from the journey, you have come to the perspective of where you come uh, come to it, that, you know, first give the, uh, you know, the, the underprivileged, the basic, you know, uh, makan, uh, khana and, uh, you know, uh, something to wear and sustenance, no shocks. And then let them then enable them to think of creation of wealth because, you know, they don't have that risk appetite to create wealth before that. Uh, uh, they may not sustain it, they may not withheld it. So with that, you know, I, I, I will just kind of a share of a couple of questions I have for you. Actually, five questions, but two. Uh, I'll give you some example. I think we have a bit of a time. My first question uh, uh, would be to CP. Uh, CP, uh, if you remember the questions which I had for you, uh, there were five of them. Uh, the first question is, uh, why you know maybe maybe his thought question is not 100 percent relevant in this context the way you're taking it but still i'll ask this question why we as a country have not been able to achieve this untapped potential of empowering the underprivileged community for creating wealth for themselves uh cp we have a thought on that uh, uh do is there an untapped potential at all for the underprivileged to create wealth or is there none so that's why never it has been explored or I know a lot of government schemes which is trying very hard to do that, but they have been always unsuccessful for certain reasons. I also have figured out why they have been unsuccessful. You know, uh, uh, between the corporate or, you know, uh, funds, they may not be create, trying to help, you know, underprivileged to create wealth, but government is trying uh, uh, to put the best foot forward to do it. They have thousands of schemes. Somehow or the other, they are not being successful. So, if you have any thought, uh, you know, um, why are we as a country have not been able to achieve this untapped potential of empowering? Because if you can unfold that potential, we can make the India like go anywhere. Because, you know, uh, would you have some thoughts if you on that? So, uh, thank you, Dr. Ghosh. And uh, I want to first make a quick comment on Vineet's uh, uh, presentation. And it is more of reflection from me. Uh, he grew up in Jodhpur and uh, worked in Odisha. Now, the question that is going through my mind is, uh, philanthropy was a very common subject. I also grew up in Rajasthan. And uh, it was always assumed that you would never go hungry. And the reason you would not go hungry is because somebody or the other is providing a social scheme where the food is available. Similarly, the words in India, I mean, when you had those water huts, which were called Piau, I mean, you had enough clean drinking water during summers uh, uh, through those water huts. Uh, similarly, for people who are travelers, you had dharamshalas, uh, hospitals, and educational institutes. Uh, the people that I interact with, whether it is Mahindra setting up Mahindra University or Shivnada setting up Shivnada University or a Premji uh, donating one third of his wealth uh, for the underprivileged. I mean, it gives me the confidence that it is not only the government, but that social entrepreneurship or business entrepreneurship or the individual entrepreneurship all are at play. It is now the question of, for some of us, if we are able to observe things on the ground, maybe we need to bring the private entrepreneurship on the social impact and the government uh, together. And the only reason I'm raising this example is, uh, you know, my teams were traveling into the interiors of Maharashtra into the tribal areas of Maharashtra. Uh, and Maharashtra, as we all know, is fairly well-educated state and is also the uh, the welfare has reached most of the people. 
I was actually surprised when my team told me that the underprivileged are not connected to any of the schemes that the government is running. And and you would have thought the political system encourages the vote banks and hence you they would have got the Aadhaar card. If you have an Aadhaar card, you will get ration somehow or the other. But there are disconnects. So this does not require an underprivileged or anybody. The basics that many of us need to make sure that the chain is completed. I mean, that is a reflection to the Vinit's conversation. Uh, otherwise, I can only say is that yes, uh, technology has to be leveraged. It has a potential uh, to create a shared future. I mean, we do understand that there is a leveling the rich versus poor, hungry versus people who throw away food. And in a country like India, where population is still one of the biggest challenges, I think there has to be a method of this information flow or a seamless access uh, so that we actually are able to leverage uh, digital not to solve the divide but at least to make the information available so my belief that if we can you know solve the last mile connectivity many of us talk about 4G and 5G in our conference rooms the fact is this Horace's workshop is happening uh, because of the 4G, 5G connectivity. I think if we are able to address uh, last mile connectivity, uh, we will be able to bring in uh, a much better connection between the underprivileged and the privileged. And I personally believe the privileged would like to help the underprivileged. Now, whether we do it through creating a business enterprise, through a micro enterprise, or whether we do it through microfinance, I think those are the secondary steps. Today, information gap is hindering the gap, or rather it is creating the gap between the privileged and the underprivileged. Uh, thank you, CP. Really appreciate your thoughts on that. I have a quick thought on that, you know, but yesterday uh, and the last three days, I was in a very remote village in Kalimpong. Uh, it's called Pringtham. Uh, it's a lecture village. And there I was working with, uh, you know, a Lapcha lady called Maya Lapcha and uh, he's uh, her, 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 you know, uh, kind of an adopted son. He's La she's Lapcha, but the gentleman is Raj Ranjit Rai and his own son, who is a little not so well. Um, so that's why he. So they are kind of, you know, doing doing all kind of small things. They have kind of a, in, you know, in this COVID times itself, it's so surprising. I was so impressed in this COVID time of one year, you know, three, four months. They have developed an integrated animal husbandry and not very large. They've invested five, six lakhs from their own pocket. Some of them managed and they've invested that. And now they have many things going. And the way they have done it is that this guy, Ranjit, he has been a sports person. He's about 27 years old. He has been a sports person on his life. And he, he has been out. He has not been in a village. He's been out around in the country, sometimes in Kolkata, in Siliguri, Delhi. So he has gathered knowledge in his smartphone. He has access. When he, went, when he goes back to his home and he you know, connects with his uh, village people and then he realized that I can make a difference. And exactly CP what he said, he has a smartphone. He's always on it, not always. When He works very hard and he's giving out dana to the murgis and the pigs. And now he wants to create an FPO because he, has the, he doesn't speak English almost at all. He cannot speak. He's very uncomfortable. We have been communicating via WhatsApp to him. So it's a big you know, game changer having a smartphone. He's been connecting on his WhatsApp to us all the time, uh, messaging. I'll give you many examples. But these are underprivileged people who are already on the first step of creating wealth for themselves. So, Vineet, in three years' time, I will come to you when I have a, you know, we are creating an FPO out there. First, to get all those guys together. Parallelly, we are creating a public or a private limited company, which will work as the marketing and the, you know, uh, you know main base to get any funding, which is private funding from organizations like you. And then can create the further infrastructure. So initially, with the FPO, will create the larger structure, getting all the government schemes, whether it's the uh, you know FPO inf agri infrastructure fund of two crores, or where without losing any kind of equity, and we'll create that in next two, three, four years time. 
and then reach out to organizations like you to get funding for heavy duty, not on the FPO, but on the, you know, the front body. So this is where I see that underprivileged are equipped capabilities. They are making it happen. And, uh, you know, uh, I think, Abe, you'd like to give a live example for the project which you have supported, funded through CSR funding. Uh, Travel like Limited, you want to share something? I'm sure you know enough about it to share. If you, I can, I can, I can compliment you uh, with more information. Travel like Limited is a limited company. Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, our group initiatives uh, have this pillar focused around entrepreneurship. But we were finding it very difficult to actually identify entrepreneurs from the Dalit and tribal communities. And the few people we identified, I mean, at some point, we actually categorized jobs we can give them. And we found that we can give them only uh, what we call low tech jobs, which is, uh, you know, housekeeping or cleaning, that type of thing. But we wanted them to be able to supply us uh, goods and services and, uh, you know, take up projects. And actually, we found it very difficult. I mean, uh, we, we actually uh, invested a lot of our own efforts to get some people to help them with the doing some construction for our own uh, factories and all that. Right, right. So somewhere the jump from having ideas or capabilities to being an entrepreneur, that wasn't happening. And we were also not able to help them because we are also not in that space. We are in still say the space of steel processing and we are trying to do something for the community. And then when Total Start came around, uh, I, I, I suppose you remember the conversation I was asking, you know, whether you can do something for the tribals and do you have something in Jharkhand? Because that was something that was actually, uh, we were finding it a, as a problem because we do work with several NGOs. Most of them, uh, who work with the tribals? Uh, and most of them are focused on providing education, providing infrastructure. We had a very successful project called Dharo Hath, where we transformed a whole uh, rural area by building check dams. Uh, we were supporting the people to build check dams so that they can do farming throughout the year, etc. But it was not kind of transforming into the area of entrepreneurship. And then... Uh, uh, when Protostat came up with this idea of tribal ag and uh, something that we never thought about that they need to get corporatized, first of all, to have access to certain government funds, etc. That thought had never crossed our mind because, you know, we were waiting for somebody else to think about it. And uh, fortunately, you thought about it. And that has really uh, been a, a role model. And we have discussed it in uh, several of the Tata Group uh, level discussions on affirmative action. And this is one of those uh, projects that were uh, considered a best practice. So I think it's the beginning of something big. And if you can have, a, you know, more and more tribal lags and, you know, get them to the level where they can, you know, it runs by itself. Now you, they've acquired the skills, they know what to look for, they know how to connect and uh, it runs itself. I think it's going to make uh, you know very big difference, and uh, we haven't seen many projects of this nature, and it's probably still uh, uh, you know bit of an experiment. But from what whatever we have seen, I think that this is something that uh, this model can make a huge difference. So from that point of view, uh, definitely we have to create wealth for the underprivileged, and. Uh, that wealth creation can come from people who have wealth. It can also come from, you know, their own community in, uh, you know, supported initially by people who have the ideas or who can understand the business. But I think that there is a potential in, uh, I mean, this is going to have a multiplier effect because when people see one scheme like this succeed and, you know, people running it on their own, then more and more, people from the underprivileged community would be uh, inspired to you know, become entrepreneurs and take up projects. And I think somewhere it reduces their risk perception because if there's somebody to support you in the beginning and get you going. And then, you know, you need not be there. You can move on to a different project, but they, they can run it themselves. So uh, I think uh, the uh, tribal ag example is a you know, really good example and uh, I don't think that without 
the involvement of uh, some entity from out of the uh, you know outside the underprivileged community like total start or suryo ghosh they wouldn't have thought about getting corporate rights or they wouldn't have understood what it means to set up a company and you know uh, you know have your own uh, uh, the corporate structure you know formally get access to funds that are available from the government and from others so uh, i think uh, suryo you can actually add a lot more to what i'm saying uh, i'll just but, share a little bit uh, thought on that we did a we have been working with the support of abram uh, and tsdpl for about 3 four this is the fourth year first one year actually we kind of you know scouted we have a program for incubating and scaling micro and small district level entrepreneurs which we do across 25 districts across the country selectively we are not so big and we are not so resourced to do it all districts across the 12 states in eastern zone and northeast so we uh, with the help of uh, abe and uh, tsdpl we started for simu with simu saraikal karsavan we kind of did a lot of grassroots level engagement with lots of uh, you know underprivileged community possibly probably prospect entrepreneurs doing something and we realized that you know but when you come they meet us and then individually it was impossible to get something out of them to do, make them do something because they always expect that when you come the next month and they will you know it's a lucky plan i fir bataiye sir well no we don't have and you have not made your own plans because whatever information we give it so we realized and we knew that for a while we still start at in level of doing individual level you know enablement of entrepreneurship at the under privilege and you know but i think it's the same problem for whether you are educated you still it's difficult for you to be an entrepreneur so we realized and we knew that the only thing to help is that we aggregate them together and we hold them together as a team and we have heavy and high impact engagement with them so till now right now we have created day one a limited company called travel like limited the idea is to have about 1000 farmers in the thousand farmers and agriculturists involved all from that area of singhum and about 10000 acres of land doing traditional organic farming it's a unpublished unlisted not unpublished unlisted limited company which you want to take it to the you know stock exchange in 5 7 10 whatever time it takes doesn't matter but day one the thought is that we will take it listed and you know it may take the path where i can, i may take vinit self it may take the path where we are getting grants from you know organizations like uh, you know uh, tspdl tsdpl or you know maybe mahindra foundation or hcl fund any one of them can get grant initial period we can get government funding in agri infrastructure fund and anything those are they have to to go so point is that this underprivileged community they don't have the very wisdom to understand uh, to know how to go about doing it's the moment you know uh, we are we are plugged in very much we are part of the management team uh, the ceo is a travel himself he's kelara murmu so it's it's it's, it's going i think not brilliantly but pretty steady pretty stable and pretty steady we have now about 400 acres of land and about 50 uh, 70 odd farmers and now we're going to add up the 100 farmers who are going to be stakeholders in the company in the travel like limited uh, or in the few which you're creating but they'll be a beneficiary and then maybe in 3 4 years time uh, we need we may come to you saying that would you be able to invest and then you say okay this is a real case so this is where you're saying that day one we start with and, and these are all you know under privileges they don't have they have a piece of land beyond that they don't have anything they somehow manage this of us crunch and they are waiting for you know, as as when it said you know some support from the you know they are not too far away from janship with a lot of industries they have the tatas and others you get some help from them little bit so normally they get you know the the thought of being an entrepreneur for them is maximum being a you know doing odd jobs of you know tilling the garden so tsdpl has many small contracts from the tribal where they have benefited them by giving them you know per, Uh, you know some odd jobs of contracting of you know gardening some and few things like that you know with some uh, uh, lorry moving from them because beyond that they cannot think they cannot do contractual job that that's all the travels could do but now they have a, a organization a limited company with their stakeholders shareholders and they're looking at many different things they're having partnerships with many companies that's a that's an example we have many examples uh, like that It, some of them slow some of them uh, you know going uh, good but you know it's a very hard journey it's still a hard journey for us and we'll share that later so with that i just you know uh, not share anymore vinith uh, you uh, you know i shared my thought uh, cp and a uh, what's your thought uh, on that topic of are there real cases that the underprivileged community can do things for themselves by themselves by creating enterprises and creating wealth from day one you said that they first need to be fed i agree but you know uh, they can be fed uh, there are many ways to feed them but while parallelly when we put them as a community 
and work them together we can do it what's your thought on that vinith and your you know your your take on that i cannot vinith cannot hear you vinith you have to uh, yeah unplug you know i i have actually no qualms with it in fact it's a great thing if you can create community enterprises that's actually one of the best way to create distributed wealth i gave the example of rang sutra which is actually a greatly successful i also had zameen organics which was actually a failure uh, both community enterprises one became very successful one i lost a lot of money uh, but there are also lots of other examples pradhan's work in actually creating a 300 400 crore enterprise out of in uh, by having all the women tribal men who have never gone to school also actually uh, selling chicken and now doing 400 crore in terms of turnover is an exceptional example in uh, in uh, uh, in uh, in madhya pradesh in bastar district in bastar bastar area uh, there are similarly pradhan has done a tremendous amount of job in gumla gumla where they have been able to create massive uh, production of tomatoes and today you have to people are from as far as calcutta are coming to buy tomatoes in gumla which is back of beyond and one of the more that's in jharkhand uh, right gumla gumla is in jharkhand yeah yeah gumla in jharkhand so so i think uh, the question is uh, wealth distribution can happen so for example let me give you some examples of why i think this is a very difficult and a important way but a very difficult way of bringing about change and i'll try to take you a little up to explain to you where i am coming from so in 2015 194 governments of the world came together to sign what you call sustainable development goals now this is the first time ever in the history of mankind so many of human women kind mankind all put together we are talking about gender sensitivity so i'm actually bringing both the genders together uh, what what was sustainable development goals it's basically n94 presidents and prime ministers saying that we would like to imagine a world that will be very different from anything humanity has ever seen in the past uh, which effectively means no poverty no hunger and uh, no inequity no gender disparity no caste no creed no race all this to be achieved by 2030 now how do you do it it's all good to sign it and agree it it is a very powerful document because all the governments have signed it how do you achieve it and so i was part of a, a committee chaired by paul polman uh, where we wrote a report called better business better world and where we predicted that if the world has to change then we have to invest 2.5 trillion dollar every year for next 12 years now this report was written in 2018 there was no covid and uh, so roughly 30 trillion dollar now that's actually 10 12 times of india's economy uh, india's gdp that has to be invested So it's not a small amount of capital now where will the capital come from just to give you a thumb rulish estimate uh, the total donor capital of the world is 300 billion annually that means government of india government of us dfid everybody put together spends roughly 300 billion dollars now you have a capital gap of 90% here 3 3 trillion 2.5 3 trillion dollar is needed 300 billion dollars is available now now look at it in the context of the power you are trying to attract capital to change the world the demand for capital is 2.5 trillion the total capital of all the governments put together that is going in philanthropy slash support slash donor is 300 billion how will change the world and so instead of regaling ourselves and that's where i also changed while doing that work so where is the money the money is so i actually then we analyze what is the global pool of capital the global pool of capital in 2012 was 300 trillion and today it has become 400 trillion so the pool of capital that is available in the world is very very large compared to the demand to change the world it's only 1% per year now if the global pool of capital increases by 2 or 3% you are asking people to sacrifice that 1% to change the world the problem is the global pool of capital is very commercial it prefers to grow so there are two things that have happened in my view that have brought one covid has happened and covid has taken the fear of god to the powerful because people have realized having money does not save you <laughs> a lot of rich people have died and so the powerful are fearful and the worlds don't change because dr ghosh and vinith rai are trying to change the world the world change when powerful want to change the world to secure themselves and i genuinely believe what is going on right now is in a post covid world there is a clear understanding that this climate change 
climate change affects the tribals that you are talking about, Dr. Ghosh. Climate change does not impact the rich guys who have 10,000 uh, acres of land. It impacts those who have half an acre land. So when all these big challenges, they used to be meant for the poor, not for the rich. COVID has taken this fear down to them. And in that post-COVID world, the capital, this $300 trillion, is willing to sacrifice half a percent of its growth to actually secure its future. And I believe our job is to actually knock out that door and try to take money from them because they had the money. Right now, we are firing, fighting for the very small amount of money that is there. And it is distributed between feeding a hungry child to actually building an enterprise. And I would always let that 300 billion go to feed the hungry child, then to an enterprise. And for the enterprise, we need to fight with the 300 trillion and try to get money out. And if in that unequal fight, COVID, despite all the destruction it has done, and I'm an entrepreneur, so I always see a silver lining in the darkest of clouds. I'm seeing the positive of it. It has put the fear of God. And there is a chance, a very small chance for people like us to demonstrate to that 300 trillion that give us that 1%, we might actually be able to protect this money if not return it to you. And uh, if we can protect it, that itself would be able to change the lives of all the tribals, all the poor, all the underprivileged. The 800 million people who are at the base of the pyramid, they actually will have an opportunity to participate because you will have the money to lose. Right now, you are expecting an extremely underprivileged person with very little resources to fight an uphill battle to create success. That's actually going to even Silicon Valley has an 80 percent failure rate, which has one of the best, most talented people working together. You will have 99.99 percent failure rate in the kind of impoverished areas you are working with. What we have to do is bring in enough money so that we can fight this 99.9. And Avishkar is actually trying to fight for you to bring that money into the game. And that's really where the difference. So difference is not about whether the underprivileged should become entrepreneurs. The difference is the fight is not to make underprivileged entrepreneurs bring in enough money so that that 99.9% fail, failure rate uh, is acceptable. Silicon Valley accepts 80%. So why can't we accept 99.9%? And we are not really anywhere compared to Silicon Valley when it comes to underprivileged doing entrepreneurship. That's really where the challenge is. So my personal, this thing is let's rise above and see what challenge we are fighting with. And the challenge really is not in the CSR funds. That's too small. 17,000 crores, the entire India's capital. The demand is far outraised that 17,000 crores because we have stopped taking the international capital. We have to increase the quantum of money. And I think that's where the challenge is. Uh, uh, that, was, that's, that was an excellent insight, uh, Vineet. And I think we can carry on this session for long. And there's so much to talk. I have hardly got anything covered. But I think that's enough. I think we have gone. Uh, CP had to leave because, you know, he had commitments. Uh, it's gone beyond his time. I'm sure you also have commitments. So I just take up, you know, two minutes to uh, round, wind up. Uh, 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 Abe, you know the direction we going. Uh, uh, we need now. You know a little bit closer that what you're trying to do. You knew from before also, but now you know a little bit more because you had a one-on-one. -on -one -on. uh, so, uh, what's your recommendation for what we should do? What uh, what we should do as an organization uh, in the next year? And we could you know engage others to do along with you. What should be a recommendation, uh, Abe? If you just tell us in. You know, two, three recommendations from your side we should take up and we should push through and follow through. What would be your recommendation for us to carry it on? I think pick up one or two fights and then keep fighting those fights. Uh, as I said, capital is extremely, extremely constrained. Uh, okay. You're fighting on one side a hungry child or the other side you're trying to create an entrepreneur whose chances of success are very low. But it is very important because they are coming from a background where uh, you're actually trying to grow. You're trying to put a seed in Sahara Desert and trying to put a bucket of water there and expect a tree to happen. Uh, I would prefer, I would love to, for it to happen. But instinctively, I know that uh, you have to put many buckets of water for many, many years for the tree to survive. I, and I have a, sorry, sir. I have a different thought, Vinit. Mm. Uh, the, the startup ecosystem, billions of dollars are getting invested, right? But the success rate is only, you know, whatever, few percentages. So if similar number of amount, if you forget about that, one-tenth, one-fifth of that amount gets invested in the our ecosystem of community entrepreneurship development, the, the success rate will be much higher than I challenge you, it will be much, much higher than the, you know. Dr. Gush, that's why you're, you have to actually get that money reach you. 
which yes, is exactly yes, what yes. I am saying. You can only be successful if you will find that water. But if you right. only have one bucket of water, you should not put the seed into a desert. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I, I got your yeah. point. I got yeah. your so point. the point is not that if you if you have twenty two thousand buckets of water, then uh-huh. for two thousand days you can stretch it, and then in the in the desert also you will have a banyan tree. But that's unfortunately not true. You only have one bucket. <laughs> So, right, right, right. so while what you are doing is incredible, uh, in some sense, it is actually taking you up onto a path of failure, not of success. Yeah. And I say it because I want you to be successful because what I got you it. I got the, right, it. the right way, right. you need that water and without water, you will not succeed. So I think a significant amount of your time should go to find the water. The seed is Get there. The money, which the, you did about in the, in the first two, five years, which I know, I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> we say you to get the water. So okay. that's the challenge, and that's the I challenge have to get we have to solve. I agree with you. Yeah. But see, you are not the water my uh, plants. <laughs> you know, see, this is actually a fight. See, my success actually creates all kind of water to open. I ah. have been trying to do exactly what you were doing, and I changed ah. and corrected myself. Because uh-huh. if I don't deliver returns, then no investor will give money to anybody else. Avishkar is the largest impact fund in India. Absolutely. If Avishkar does not return, then nobody else will get money. Or ah. somebody else will get money if they do something better than me. So if right, right. so, I think there are two choices. I fail, and then you have to become better than me. That will just prolong the time. The second is I become successful so that you don't need to spend so much time because money will open. I think India is going to see a renaissance. A lot of Indians are going to put money into what you are doing uh, as Indians become wealthy. Uh, the millennials, the new generation, is far more, uh, uh, far more, uh, far less conservative with the money. Uh, than our generation or the generation before. And you will see people actually opening up and giving away far more. And the kind of thing that you are doing will find it. You are 10 years ahead of your time. You have to be patient for some time. Like, like you, you were uh, when you started off, right? When you yeah. started your... Uh, thank you. We really appreciate your uh, very kind of you. Uh, babe, you want to say your uh, final recommendation for us to carry on what you... Uh, I, I'll, I'll take uh, Vinny's input very... And in aggressively, and you know, raise money for whatever little we are doing. And uh, if- so I, I think uh, you know, uh, I really appreciate Vineet's insights because he's worked in the field and he's in a very different position from where I am. And uh, to uh, actually have uh, uh, you know, uh, very different insights because he's investing into this uh, type of projects. And uh, I mean, after listening to him, what I would suggest, uh, Suryo, is that there has to be many total starts or there has to be, uh, you know, a total start has to spread its wings much more. So yes, which means yes. that we need to think about the organization. Yes. When do you now get a thousand volunteers on board to, you know, replicate that scale so that you have a thousand projects going and one of them becomes very scalable and, you know, you can attract that uh, bit of the 300 trillion that beneath this talking about right. so right. i think that there is a need to uh, you know uh, scale. scale up the F, the total start part of the effort not the you know because you'll have to work with maybe 100 times more uh, potential entrepreneurs than we are doing today yes. and that uh, you know which means that you need I to have you. arms and legs uh, I have to have more arms and legs and there we have to figure out to get the money, then we can get the arms and legs. Yeah. And that's what we yeah. need said. Get the you know, money required. So it's a, yeah. It is a, so, uh, a sort of a cycle because you need to make sure that uh, there are enough experiments going going on to assure you of at least uh, some one of them will succeed and then you know, that can showcase and that can attract uh, capital. And uh, I mean, definitely, I think uh, you know, we can discuss further uh, you yes, know, offline yes. on how we can make that happen. Mm-hmm. But, There's uh, a lot of government mm-hmm. capital available. There's a lot of government capital available to start a fake start. But anyway, uh, thanks again, Vini. Much appreciate Abe so much. Thank you so much. And I think I think there's so much to talk, but, you know, we just, we have gone past our time. And thank you. And keep on, you know, your good friends. Good, you know. Thank you, uh, you know. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Look forward, look forward to meeting you and Vini in person. Yes. 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 Bye bye. Uh, when Vinit comes here next time, I, I will see that, you know, I'll ask Vinit when he's there. Thanks. Bye, Sujir. Okay. Bye. Bye then.